Auction. Rampant technology eliminates luxury, but not by declaring privilege a human right. Rather, it does so by both raising the general standard of living and cutting off the possibility of fulfillment. The express train that in three nights and two days hurtles across the continent is a miracle, but traveling in it has nothing of the faded splendor of the train bleu. What made up the voluptuousness of travel, beginning with the goodbye waving through the open window, the solicitude of amiable acceptors of tips, the ceremonial of meal times, the constant feeling of receiving favors that take nothing from anyone else has passed away, together with the elegant people who were wont to promenade along the platforms before the departure, and who will be now who will by now be sought in vain, even in the foyers of the most prestigious hotels. That the steps of railway carriages have to be retracted intimates to the passenger of even the most expensive express, that he must obey the company's terse regulations like a prisoner. Certainly the company gives him the exactly calculated value of his fare, but this includes nothing that research has not proved in average demand. Who, aware of such conditions, could depart on impulse on a voyage with his mistress as once from Paris to Nice? Or Nice, Nice. But one cannot be rid of the suspicion that even luxury that deviates from the norm, announcing itself ostentatiously as such, is mingled with an increasing element of premeditation, artificial show. It is meant, in keeping with Veblen's theory, to permit the wealthy to demonstrate their status to themselves and others, rather than to satisfy their needs, which in any case are becoming increasingly undifferentiated. While a Cadillac undoubtedly excels a Chevrolet by the amount that it costs more, this superiority, unlike that of the old Rolls-Royce, nevertheless itself proceeds from an overall plan which artfully equips the former with better, the latter with worse cylinders, bolts, accessories, without anything being altered in the basic pattern of the mass-produced article. Only minor rearrangements in production would be needed to turn the Chevrolet into a Cadillac. So luxury is sapped, for amid universal fungibility, happiness attaches without exception to the non-fungible. No human exertions, no formal reasoning can sever happiness from the fact that the ravishing dress is worn by only one, and not by twenty thousand. The utopia of the qualitative, the things which through their difference and uniqueness cannot be absorbed into the prevalent exchange relationships, takes refuge under capitalism in the traits of fetishism. But this promise of happiness and luxury in turn presupposes privilege, economic inequality, a society based on fungibility. Thus the qualitative itself becomes a special case of quantification. The non-fungible becomes fungible. Luxury turns into comfort and finally into a senseless gadget. This vicious circle would put an end to luxury even without the leveling tendency of mass society, over which reactionaries wax sentimentally indignant. The inner constitution of luxury is not unaffected by what happens to the useless in its total incorporation into the realm of use. Its remnants, even objects of the highest quality, already look like junk. The valuables cramming the homes of the very rich cry out helplessly for the museum, yet there the meaning of sculpture and paintings, as Valerie perceived, is destroyed, only architecture, their mother, showing them their rightful place. But kept by force in the houses of people with whom they have no ties, they are an open affront to the mode of existence which private property has now adopted. If there was still some excuse for the antiques with which millionaires surrounded themselves up to the first war, and that they heightened the idea of the bourgeois home to a dream, a nightmare, without disintegrating it, the chinoiseries subsequently adopted merely tolerate uh, sullenly the private owner who only feels at ease in light and air that are barricaded by luxury. Modern practical luxury is a contradiction in terms that may just provide a living for false Russian princes, hired by Hollywood people as interior decorators. The lines of advanced taste converge in asceticism. The child reading the Arabian Nights, intoxicated by the rubies and emeralds, wondered why possession of the stones should cause such ecstasy when they are described, after all, not as means of exchange, but as a hoard. 
In this question is involved the whole dialectic of enlightenment. It is as reasonable as it is unreasonable. Reasonable in recognizing idolization. Unreasonable in turning against its own goal, which is present only where it need be justified to no authority, indeed to no intention. No happiness without fetishism. Gradually, however, the child's skeptical question has spread to every kind of luxury, and even naked sensual pleasure is not proof against it. To the aesthetic eye, which sides with the useless against utility, the aesthetic, when severed violently from purpose, becomes anti-aesthetic, because it expresses violence. Luxury becomes brutality. Finally, it is swallowed up in drudgery or conserved in caricature. What beauty still flourishes under terror is a mockery and ugliness to itself. Yet its fleeting shape attests to the avoidability of terror. Something of this paradox is fundamental to all art. Today, it appears in the fact that art still exists at all. The captive idea of beauty strives at once to reject happiness and to assert itself.